Angelina last spring. I was at Hacker School, which is a program in New York that's like a writer's workshop for programmers. You like spend all day writing code on, on whatever you want. And Stefan is one of the residents there, so he like gave a talk and then like hung out a bunch. And so I think in his talk he said something like, we have dynamic types, but you can still talk about types. I was like, oh man, I need to try this language. It's so much better than like all this confusion of like coming from Java and getting to Python and going, where are my types? Why can't I like tell you anything about my types? Um, and so naturally, one of the things I wrote that summer was this type check down jail. Um, and so type check does static analysis. So this is checking for problems in your code without running your code. Um, you don't just change your code or annotation, add annotations or anything to use it. And the checks are based on mailing list questions. So you know, somebody emails a mailing list and goes, I don't know what's going wrong with my code. And there's always the same answer. You go, know, you'll probably get a computer to check some of these, this code for you so you don't have to ask as many times. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about this is like implementing type check. And I'm going to show you how to like call function. But so there's sort of like three parts to implementing static analysis. First, you decide what you want to check for, like what sort of problem you're looking for. Then you decide exactly what you want to check for. So like what precisely you're going to look for that's going to tell you that there's this problem. <coughs> and then the rest is implementation details, which is, you know, with less frustrating usually and more frustrating because all the information is there, it's just undocumented. <laughs> <laughs> and so most of we're going to talk about deciding exactly what to check for. Because it doesn't really t t take very long to tell you what we're going to check for. Um, and so there's two like important sort of overall things with that, with type check. One, we're trying to only warn you when something is actually wrong. So I have, uh, I'm going to accept a large like false negative rate where I like, say you don't have a problem and you actually do, as long as I don't have very, very many false positives where everything is fine and I start warning you. Because if I warn you about stuff all the time and you're going to oh, the warnings are fine, just ignore them. At, whereas if I only worry you very occasionally, they'll go, oh, I should fix that one. Um, the other thing is that I'm not doing any actual type inference. I'm depending entirely on the compiler's type inference. And that's because if I did my own like other thing, then like we wouldn't actually know much about your code as it was running, because that depe the code generally <coughs> depends on how the type is inferred by the compiler. So we're only actually interested in what the compiler thinks anyway. Um, and so I'm going to be going through three different checks. Um, there are a couple more things in type check, but these are like three interesting ones. Um, and then at first I'm going to go through what each of them is, and then we're going to go into more depth about like how they're implemented and what they like mean. Um, and so we have checking loop variables. So this is when you have a loop, you care about how fast the code is in the loop because you're probably going to run the same code a lot. Um, one of the things that can slow down your loops is having loop variables that change their type. If they change their type during the loop, then there's probably going to be you know, a branch in your assembly code somewhere that has to say, you know, well, which type am I using right now? And there's also probably going to be box, like, more memory usage as you allocate box <coughs> versions of your variable. Um, and so this will examine the types of variables used in the loop and tell you if they're unstable. So, Another one is no method errors. You've probably encountered these before. They're what happens if you try to call a method of a function and it's not implemented. So they're a runtime error, but they're basically equivalent to what static compilers would yell at you about for type errors. Um, and so you want to try to find as many of them as you can statically. Um, this is especially useful if you're generating methods that you don't actually run all of them in your unit tests, or if you have a big library like base and you know there's some dusty corners of it that people don't call all the time and you don't happen to have any like, test for. The last one we're going to do is like looking for misspelled variables. You know, you're, you're going along typing your code and you type it a different way one time. And if you're, so if you're call, if you're like using it on the right hand side, so you're like using the value, you'll probably get an error when it's undefined. If you're using it on the left hand side, then you just like lost some information, but you probably it's not going to give you an error because well, okay, he's making a new, he's making you know x instead of y, and you know now your x has five, but you were expecting y to have five, and it just gives you a bug. That's much harder to find. Um, and so I'm going to start with talking about checking variable types. So these are two versions of very similar code. On the left, we have function a. 
So it starts with variable sum equal to zero. The zero literal isn't at 64. So sum is of type of 64. We go through for i is 1 to 100. So i is an int. We add i divided by 2. So i divided by 2 is an int divided by an int. That's going to be a float 64. And we add it to sum. An int plus a float. Float is going to be a float 64. So sum on the first iteration of loop changes types. After that, sum is a float 64, and we're just adding floats. And then we return sum. On the right, we have E. It has two characters different. We just made sum equal to zero as a float instead of it. And that means that sum is type stable throughout the function. It's just always a float 64. So what we're going to do is we're going to run each function once, and then we're going to time them. So showing the interesting parts for the timing part, obviously there's only 100 iterations, so it's pretty fast. So 9.5 seconds times 10 to the negative 6 for A, 2.2 times 10 to the negative 6 for B. And so if you wanted to go better timings, you'd make the loops bigger or whatever. But the interesting part here, actually, when I ran them, I went, wait a minute, I think I see a difference. <laughs> so we have 3 kilobytes of allocation for A and 64 bytes for B. And so you know, that's a lot more for A. Um, and so that probably, it means that A is allocating more memory. It doesn't mean that A ever used three kilobytes of memory at once. It just means you know, your code is running along, it allocates some more memory, and we add it to the, to the total, it allocates more memory. And the average collector also runs through and vacuums up some memory, but we don't decrease the total because of that. And so, uh, just to make sure it's inside the loop that's the problem, you can you know, make the loop 100 times bigger, and you see 100 times more memory usage. So it's pretty clear that most of that is due to the loop. Uh, so if we dig further into A, this is the code type of A. It's too small for you to read, as you're showing you. You get this wall of text. Uh, and we're going to dig into parts of this. So the first part is, near the beginning, there's a list of all of the variables in the function and their types. And so the first variable in the list is sum. And in A, we get type NA for sum. And in B, we get type of float 64. This is like your first clue that there's probably something wrong with sum that it didn't get type of right. So this is the rest of the, the output of code type. This is the actual like, type inferred code. And in orange, we have the references to sum. So there's one up here for where it got initial, initialized, one in the middle of the loop. And then this is at the bottom where you're returning it. This is, in blue, we have the whole loop. So the blue part is just like incrementing i and checking some conditions, boring loop stuff. And then this is, orange line is the interesting part of the part with sum. Again, this is b's, it looks basically the same. The difference is in this one orange line. And so on the top, we have the line from a, and on the bottom, the one from b. And so in a, we have sum is of type union in 64 float 64. And then in or orange, you have plus sign, so it's using the plus function. And then blue is just how you divide i by 2. On the bottom, the difference is we're using the intrinsic add float function, and sum is of type float 64, and then the blue part is exactly the same. So you can see the like, actual difference of the inside of the loop based on whether the type inference in the type or not. Um, you can also see the difference if you like go to the assembly code. So this is two columns of tiny text for A, and versus one column with slightly larger text for B. <laughs> <laughs> and so the reason I think that A is slower is that you know, it's allocating all that memory, and there's also like a lot more complexity here because it like so floats are immutable, and if you have like you don't know what sum is, you have to box sum, and then you're on the heap. And then you add two floats together, and then you have a new float that you also have to box and put on the heap. And so you're allocating all this memory, as opposed to having an unboxed float that can be on the stack and just be mutated. Um, and so that's like an example of the impact that having one, you just put sum equals zero instead of sum equals 0, 0.0. I really like to be able to like know that something is going wrong, rather than like just not knowing why it's as slow as it is. And so if you want to run this on your code, you can call check loop types, which is a function in type check. Um, it will tell you, it will give you the signature of the method that it's complaining about. So A takes no arguments, returns float of stick, float or int, 
and then sum is the variable that's the problem, so it's invented. Um, and if you have multiple methods that are at issue, it will like, list all of them and then the variables that it's concerned about. And so we're going to do no method errors. So as I said, you know, we're predicting no method errors statically. Um, and so if you were going to do this, you know, by hand, you would go through and go, okay, so we know this is the only method for A, and we know that it takes an int and is doing some very reasonable things, modding it by seven. A is totally okay. You go B, B takes an int, divides it by two and calls A. We know that A does not, as we can do methods of A and go, A has no method to handle in 64. Um, and so we know that, you know, dividing an int by an int is going to give us a point 64. I think the head inference even just you know, tells you that. But so you can look it up. Um, and we know that A of flow 64 is no method error because we can take the methods of A and we can look at what arguments they take. And so this is actually like, this is kind of boring to talk about the implementation of beyond this because it's just digging through the AST and figuring out how each piece of the AST represents its return type and then you know, looking at the methods. So it's pretty trivial other than like digging through the AST. So what I'm going to talk about is like issues I got to make on base from like running this. So there's this QR fact function. I don't really know what it does, but you know there's QR fact of number. Nobody really does. <laughs> <laughs> and it calls this QR function something else in base, and it takes two arguments. And so we have you know we can look at the methods of QR and go okay well you know we got the right number of arguments here. We have this one in pink. And it's, a, it's supposed to be a two-dimensional array. And we have this one in yellow, and it's supposed to be a one-dimensional array. Uh, OK. Well, if you, uh, if you actually call QR fact with a number, so you just need to use two, because this is the only like numerical thing that QR, QR fact takes, you'll get an error where it will complain that you're trying to call QR fact with a matrix, which is what we already said it wanted, and another matrix. So this one is, has the wrong type, or that it is of the wrong type for calling QR with. Um, and so this is one of the things is that given no method errors, it's actually pretty easy to describe what's going wrong because you know it'll tell you you're calling this with the wrong types. And you go, okay, well I agree. There's no method of that type, and it's clearly of that type. So this one got fixed out. I had to pay attention to how because it was something about QR involved knowing how QR fact works, but you can file the issue without knowing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is another piece of code in base. It's too small for you. I just wanted to put the whole chunk of code there. So what it's actually doing is generating these methods to make these very specialized matrix types compatible with each other. Um, and so it's doing plus and minus. So the outermost loop is going through plus and minus operators. And then we have these two nested loops. There's like three sets of these loops in here, and I'm just looking at the first one. Because they're all pretty similar. So we're, we're going through this matrix of this list of special matrix matrix types. And for each of those matrix types, we then look at the inner loop, the innermost loop is going through all of the ones we haven't gotten to yet. So we're going to take each pair, and we're going to generate two methods <coughs> for each like, ordering of those two pairs of types. And what we're doing is basically converting one of them. I think you're called convert the less sparse one to the the, the, le the more sparse one to the denser type. And so this is just going, well, if we can add two matrices of the same type together, then we can convert one of them to the other type, and then they'll be compatible. We don't write you know, extra code by hand. And so these are the methods generated by this part of piece of the code where that the method error warns about. Um, so it's not saying that this signature is bad. It's saying that this whatever we're generating for these signatures is going to ha cause no method errors when you call it. You know, this is generated code, so there's probably a systematic error in it rather than like some random errors. And sure enough, all of them use the triangular type, which is triangular matrices. Um, and so if you wanted to actually like, you know, confirm the code is actually working, uh, that my code is working and this code isn't. <laughs> you can make a triangular matrix. Uh, I'm not really sure what the U does. I just know that you know that's what the s signature of the function does. Um, and if you try to add two of them together, you get the, the no method error, which is what we were predicting actually. So if you make a diagonal, 
um, matrix. So these have the right types, which is the important part. Um, then if you try to add D, which is diagonal, and T, which is triangular, so it's going to call the method we're looking for. You can add, use at which to ask which method you're going to call. And if you actually call it, you get no method because of triangulars. Um, and so if you actually, like, if you were to define them, then this would all be fine. It's not a very important issue since nobody else reported it before me, and apparently no one has actually. I looked up in Facebook like a week ago, and it's still there. But this is like, these are the two functions that are missing that cause all of those new method um, warnings. And Jay Howe made a very nice comment on my issue. Thanks for going through all the linear algebra code, by the way. It's no new feat. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want, too want to get extra credit without very much work. <laughs> You could run uh, check method calls. So it takes you know a function just like before. This one I'm still working out how to set the module to look up the definitions in. So if running on base, it's fine. Module def defaults to base, so you get all of the other base methods to look up. But when you actually look up some of the stuff, I forget which part exactly, but it looks up some of the stuff inside a module because of the way the, in the API works. So if you're doing stuff in the REPL, you should use main because then it'll see all your other definitions. Um, yeah, so this will also warn you unnecessarily if you don't load all of your, import all of your modules, like using all of them, since like it won't see some of the definitions that you actually want it to have. Yeah, so that's check method calls. Um, so the last one is misspelled variables. So these are two pieces of code. I've already told you there's a variable misspelling somewhere. There's 11 lines of code. I'll give you a moment to you know, look for the problem. Yeah. So uh, we have answer and then and or sir. <laughs> and so this code will work, and the other code will have this problem where answer return retur we return zero, and you'll be very confused. You know, I'm passing in x. I I'm pretty sure this is like actually summing things, but at the same time, I keep getting zero. Um, and so one of the reasons, like, because, so this d sugar is to it answer equals answer plus one. Um, and so that's to be used on both sides. So would that give an arrow when you run it? Yeah. I think that probably would, yeah. Okay. Because it's using it on the right hand side too. So we have left hand side usages. So if x equals five, then x is a left hand side usage. If we're using things on the right hand side, then we have x plus two. Like if you were like just wrote a function that was x plus two, then that would be a right hand side usage of x. Um, or if you have y equals x plus two, or you could use both, such as you know x plus equals two. So the left hand side usages are the most dangerous because you can mis for mis in the case of misspelling, since you kind of like to you this left hand side won't give you an error. Right hand side will give you an undefined problem unless you like accidentally define it someplace else and you're shadowing it. Um, if you're both, you also get there because that's right hand side. Um, and so you can, if you write a function, you can collect left hand side usage really easily. You can look for all the equals expressions in the type inferred ASD. As it's all cleaned up and pretty orderly, you can just look for these particular expressions and pull off their first their first argument, which is what they're putting something into. Um, if you make one of the right hand side usages, which is actually more difficult, you have to like dig into a bunch of expressions to find all of the like symbols they're using. Um, those are implementation things. So you find a set, you get a set of each of them. If you find the difference in both directions, you'll be able to find the left hand side variables never read from and the right hand side variables that you're reading from that haven't defined in this this function. Um, and so the only one that doesn't appear there would be this. So it will give you an error, but you won't be able to find, like, this approach doesn't find it. This is the approach that uh, TypeCheck currently uses. And so, you know, you could also, that's why. I, so if you just do this, you can get the set of both the, like, both warnings. Um, yeah, so you can also you can also just go through um, the experts and only allow like one variable usage per equal sign. 
which would let you only count x once here. Um, but so, for an example that like won't give an error, but you still might be doing something wrong. Um, so we have a function, we take x, we set y equal to x plus 2 plus z. So this will give you an error, so I shouldn't have added that. But anyway, if you then return x, um, you're completely ignoring y, and maybe you wanted to return y there. So you might care about the unused variables, in this case y and z, because y is on the left hand side but never read, and then z is on the right hand side but we never defined it. And so check locals will give you a set of unused variables. I don't see check locals anymore. I think that I ch it might be only in my copy and I've changed it while I was doing the check while well, I was writing the book. Um, you might also do check underscore locals. Yeah, yeah. they'll they check underscore. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so you run type on your code, especially once that gets the new version so it has all the stuff I talked about. Um, so, and each of the functions returns a result type so that you could programmatically check whether your like functions are passing. So if you wanted to like include it in your unit type test or something, there's, it would be like trivial to write a wrapper around these functions since they aren't, even though you see all of this like printed output, it's actually just like overriding the show type on these types so that like you get the pretty human readable output immediately, but you are also like secretly getting a type back that you could use if you wanted to use it for an extra program. And that's my last one. Uh, how long does this take to run, like, say, from a command line, I call Julia type check, my function, or whatever? Because I'd love to like, put this in a make file and just run it as I'm coding without having to do tests. So I think I run it on like all of base when I test it, and so I run like each of like I think three or four different functions, and I think it takes me maybe a minute to run on everything in base plus doing like extra checks, like sanity checks that I'm getting what I want out of type check. I think that only takes like sixty to ninety seconds maybe. I haven't looked at it. What's your workflow like? Sorry, uh, if you're when, if you're developing other code and using type check on it. Uh, when when do you invoke these various methods uh, in your development process? Um, so I mean, I think that checking loop types is not important until you get the code working to begin with, probably. So like when you when you get to the point of like benchmarking it and caring about that, then check loop types is appropriate. If you're looking at the like misspelled variables, that might be a, like useful earlier on when you're like still debugging and maybe that's causing a bug. Um, the no method types are really most useful if you have a large library and it doesn't have the greatest test coverage, or like you're generating code and maybe that doesn't have a lot of text test coverage. Because it's you'll see the you no know, method error immediately when you run the code. So it's really finding errors in code that is not getting run regularly enough, or that is like got changed and like accidentally there's like one method that didn't get updated to like use the new interface or something. So there's some forms of refactoring that also kind of so one thing I've noticed when I've uh, looked at this is that uh, functions like you know, check loop types, you pass a function to them, but you don't um, pass a method signature. Um, is that a, is that a deliberate thing? Is that a, a yeah. thing? So it could change it to take the same interface as code types. Right. Um, to implement it, I like change. I added my own methods to code types so that you can. Because it's possible to get, for a fun given a function, you get every method of it. Yeah. And given a method, you can get the code typed of it. You just have to you know, do something a little funny. Um, so I can make it one that takes the whole code type thing. I, was, I guess I was running it in aggregated in the library, so it seems more useful to have the whole function. But I definitely like, add another. I mean, maybe, especially if it, yeah, I mean, I think I, think I might have, uh, you know, been you know trying to type you know something that is like convert or something right mm -hmm. that you know had 500 definitions. Oh, I assume that I would be lost to see, but if mine is the only one that has an error in it, then that's probably not a problem. So. Yeah, definitely add one that has. It's just like adding one more. Is there a plan to turn it into like a sort of like an English output or to give suggestions or? Uh, some sort of like 
friendly. Hello, I think you have a. I hadn't really thought of that, but it, it would be easy to sort of combine all of the methods. Like, it wouldn't even need to be part of like one of the methods itself. You could add something that like runs all three of them, or all, or like more, and like add some text in between them explaining what they mean. Yeah, I'm just thinking of like because. Right now, you sort of have to like look at the output and sort of understand that, like, oh, if it's a union type, that's probably yeah. more than what I want. But it, like, it would be nice if uh, if it gave sort of like an English style output that it could be used as sort of like an automatic analysis tool. Like, even in Sublime, when I'm writing code, I could have it like notate while I'm writing. Yeah. Actually, I actually have something to add to that. I don't know if this would be suitable for doing this, but um, I was thinking this would be really great, because I do this in C. For example, in my make files, I have, I have lint running, so that whenever a like, uh, file changes, make will then call lint on it, and then I can see if I, whoops, I introduce something that I may not have noticed, like months down the line, after running the code, and suddenly I get a random crash because of mistakes I made. Um, would it be suitable for doing that kind of thing? Like if I had a file that's, you know, really old, I went and added one thing, could it like check, like if, the, um, like that file was fine before, I made a change, now it's not fine, would type check then be able to detect like those kind of problems? Um, I mean, you could write some sort of, the same thing as doing sort of the actual like, checking for very specific things. It would be easy to write a wrapper around it that takes the output of each thing and understands like, okay, I got this, these ones had problems before, you've shaded and changed, these ones have problems now, and like alert you when there's a difference. That could be something that could be added to type check that's like, or could be added like a wrapper, like another package could do that by calling type check. Enhancement plans? Any additional thing you're going to add? Um, so there's one of them that I didn't talk about that's in there that's checking return types. And that's because I was putting it into the talk and then I realized they didn't like the heuristic I was using to decide whether return types are stable because it like isn't, doesn't point you to the, like the goal of return, the, like you know, you want stable return types that like only depend on the types of your arguments and not their values. Um, and so I have a check in there that tries to check that. But I don't think it, and like, what I wanted to do was sort of try to get only, only warn you about stuff when it's like the sort of root cause of the instability, and not warn you about all these functions that are happen to be calling that function as it's as like part of its return type. So like if you say, you know, I'm going to return the result of this function call, and your function that function you're calling is unstable, then I should really warn you about that function you're calling or like what it's calling that's causing this, and that your perfectly reasonable function that happens to call call a like function that's not behaving well. Um, and so the, like, I'm not happy with my heuristic, so I'm going to rewrite it. Um, but that used to be in the talk, and it's no longer. I, I just wanted to add that I think this should be integrated into the Julia C, <laughs> run Julia dash W, and, you know, uh, I, I think probably with, you know, some sort of other paranoid mode, right, you know, check arithmetic and, 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 and I have opened a pull request to start doing that. You I know. Text. I saw. I saw. It's more short term. Not. Not. Not before point three. That's okay. after tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you have uh, warnings for variables that are never read and ones yeah. that are never assigned. Uh, do you have any warnings for variables that are? Assigned, but then not read afterwards. So they might, it might be read at some point, but then they get an assignment. But then after that, it's not read. Or is there, is there too much? Like I haven't done that at the moment. That's definitely something that I could do. That would be sort of more complicated since you have to like follow the control flow. Yeah. Right now, it's just like just looking at all the places. But that's definitely okay. something that could be done using. Okay. Yeah. 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 A question probably half for Jeff as well. You seem to be using a lot of internal APIs to Julia. Yeah. So are they likely to be stable for type check to work for the foreseeable future? They haven't broken yet, and I made type check last summer. The only thing that breaks is when we base exports undefined symbols, and that breaks my tests. Um, but otherwise, there, I have a, like I don't think there's been any changes that have caused type check to crash. 
So, what would be really cool is if this can be integrated with uh, light table or you know some of the upcoming ID tech stuff, so that you know, like MATLAB points out these performance issues, you like just color the line red and stuff, and people love that. Like, you know, the time checker is running. But I think this is the right way to do it. You build those sort of programmatic API first, yes. and then you build the tools that can use that programmatic. API. Another deal cynical idea where you're just going to like profile black code and then go back and highlight the sections that were running. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 definitely a tech tech is set up to like, for you to write your own wrappers around it if you want to, and like select from any of the checks that you think is the like right next to your line for. Bringing the base is probably the first thing you should do. So there's a, recently there's the lint.jl yeah. came out. Is there like, are these things integrated, or do they have overlapping functionality, or like what's what's the relationship? I haven't looked at lint.jl yet. I like was too busy writing the talk. It um, looks like there's a couple things that lint.jl like it does the I mean very little thing that sort of stuff. But uh, I think looking at it, like I don't know if Tony is here, uh, but it, it, it looks like. Type check could probably be introduced as a dependency of lint.jl and you could use type check. Lint.jl bounced the wrong my code, so it's pretty handy. It, it, it was a branch and tested, so yeah, I recommend everyone to try it out. Like, it, it's pretty good. It's so good. just give it a quick run and see what it starts up. All right, well, thank you.